Good evening and welcome to our uh, featured keynote presentation tonight. It's my great uh, privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Everett Hook, our featured keynote speaker. Um, I'd like to start by saying if you don't know who Dr. Hook is, you're at the wrong conference. <laughs> and maybe you came as a guest with, with somebody, and if your partner didn't tell you who Dr. Hook was, I'd like to suggest you get a new partner. <laughs> but on the odd chance that one or two of you don't know who Dr. Hook is, I'd just like to say he is, without a doubt, the world's leading expert in practical rock engineering. Not only open pits, but also underground. I first met Dr. Hook at Chuki Kamada, mine in northern Chile, uh, about 30 years ago, um, and have known him um, in various capacities uh, since then. It's really good to see so many colleagues here from Chuki Kamada, um, as it's very appropriate that's the theme of Everett's and Dr. Hook's talk tonight. Over the years, I've come to appreciate many qualities of Dr. Hook, but I'll just mention four of them that for me um, sort of sum up how I view Dr. Hook. First of all, he's extremely helpful. Uh, you ask him anything and he'll give you his absolute best advice. He was just explaining to me that he did this uh, video conference uh, few months back for rock science and invited questions after the talk and he got 99 email questions and he answered every one of those. I don't think you're going to have the opportunity to submit questions from such a large group but that's the kind of man that he is. He's also very open in sharing his information through teaching, through uh, presentations like the one tonight, through writing, through serving on boards uh, of all kinds of capacities. And he's very energetic. I think if you know Dr. Hook, you would agree with me. He claims he retired in 2018, but he's still working very diligently on his uh, practical rock engineering notes. He calls them notes. I think by any standard, they're a book. Uh, but he calls them notes. And finally, uh, for me, he's one of the kindest and gentlest men I have ever met. And I, I appreciate that so much about him. He's, he's always willing to talk to you about uh, anything. And I always learn something from those discussions. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hook to give the keynote presentation tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hook. Good evening. This uh, presentation of a keynote address is for the Slope Stability 2022 Symposium in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm going to be talking about my experience with the Chukicamata mine in Chile, which is one of the world's largest open pits. I was appointed a consultant there in 1991, and I consulted with them for about 25 years. So I've seen a, a fair number of uh, developments and changes in the mine over the, these years, and I'd like to discuss some of these with you. The mine is located in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, which is the driest desert on Earth, and it's about 770 miles from Santiago, which is the capital city of the country of Chile. Um, you'll see on the map there that uh, Chile is a very long, slender country, and uh, so that the, the mine is actually located in the foothills of the Andes Mountains. 
the mine uses about 700 gallons of water a second in processing the ore, and this has to be uh, transported uh, generally in a tunnel and, and canal about uh, 150 miles from the uh, Andes Mountains. So that gives you a, a location plot for the mine in South America. In, 19, in 2018, when I was last uh, at the mine, the uh, size of the pit was, as shown here, 2.7 miles long, 1.8 miles wide, and 3,000 feet deep. Uh, Chukikamata has been mined for many, many years. Uh, in fact, in 1899, a 2,005-year-old mummy was found in a collapsed mine shaft. So it has literally been mined for centuries. Current mining in its present form started in 1915 and about 40 million tons of refined copper has been produced since then. The mine is currently owned by Codelco, which is the world largest copper producer with 11% of the world production and about 20% of the world's copper reserve. So this, this mine is one of several mines owned by Codelco uh, and uh, uh, operated in this format until about uh, 2018. Uh, I'll explain to you as we go through this presentation that uh, it is now changed to an underground block caving operation because 3,000 feet was considered the lowest economic depth to which it could be mined in this form. Before 1971, the Chukikamata was owned and operated by the U.S. Anaconda Company. And here's a photograph of the southeast face of the mine in 1968. The slopes were about 800 feet high at the time. And uh, in 1967, uh, movements in this particular slope that you see there were initiated by an, an earthquake. The slope failed on the 18th of February 1969 and it's estimated that about 400 tons of rock were involved in this failure and at that time the slope that failed was 715 feet high. <clears throat> Here's a photograph of the failed rock mass and you'll notice that there's no damage at the base of the of the slide. All the equipment and all of the personnel has been moved and uh, this was because of, of a monitoring program that I'll describe to you in a moment. Mining was suspended for 65 days, or m mining in this area rather, was suspended for 65 days while they cleared up the uh, failure. The reason for the uh, uh, movement of equipment and personnel from the mine was this monitoring system illustrated here where you see a graph showing the total cumulative uh, movements in the slope crest and the date. And you'll see that uh, movement started in September 1968 and increased uh, asymptotically uh, into 1969. And in, at the end of January 1969, that slope crest had moved 20 feet. Uh, at that point, they evacuated equipment and personnel from the mine and uh, the um, failure occurred on the 18th of February 1969. I'd like to pause for a moment here and explain why you see so much text on these slides, which is not normal for me because normally I try and have very clean slides with minimum uh, text clutter. But in this case, this is a slightly different animal in that after this uh, presentation of this keynote address, uh, it will be made available by the University of Arizona to uh, uh, participants at the conference or others who are interested over the internet. And uh, there'd probably be a copy of it uh, uh, agreed between uh, the university and Rock Science, a company in Toronto that develops software and have a number of my presentations online. Now comes the complicated bit of this uh, presentation and I'm going to keep this slide on the screen for some time while I explain this uh, uh, analysis of the probability of failure. 
obviously in talking about mining, you're dealing with very imprecise information. Rock is not a man-made material like steel or concrete. And uh, basically you get what you get and you have to deal with it. And obviously each rock has its own particular characteristics. And uh, we have to know a great deal about the rocks that we're dealing with in order to design a stable stu structure. And I'll be going through that in some detail in this presentation. I'm going to draw your attention to the big red arrow there. And what it shows is the probability of fatality of each one of us as an individual, simply because we live in the world. And you'll notice that uh, there's on the bottom line, on the, on the bottom axis, the number of fatalities expected ranging from a very small, one hundredth of a fatality per annum to 10,000 fatalities per annum uh, at the other end of the scale. And on the vertical axis is the annual probability of failure, ranging from one in 10 million to one per annum. And uh, I particularly draw your attention to the green line and the red bar underlying it. And this zone is called the ALARP region, ALARP standing for as low as reasonably practicable. And that's the region, region in which uh, uh, you hope that your project falls, but it may not, and you have to do quite a lot of work uh, to make it, to bring it as close as possible to that and minimize the risk. So that uh, what the red arrow there shows is a home accident of one fatality in 10,000 years. And that's the risk that we face as individuals simply by being alive, perhaps falling down the stairs or being electrocuting yourself, trying to change the plug. But uh, those, that, that is the, the standard that uh, focuses this particular plot uh, into what you see there. Moving on now to uh, the highest level of risk that individuals face, apart from uh, space uh, travel, uh, which I'm is number one there, and I'm not going to talk about that. But for an, a normal individual, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day or getting cancer uh, gives you a probability of fatality of one in 300. And that's the highest risk area that uh, we, we can uh, put ourselves into by either indulging or being just plain unfortunate in getting cancer. The lowest level of risk, uh, almost, is this one here, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, air travel. And you'll see that, that flying in an aeroplane, uh, the danger of fatality is about one in 100,000. Um, the only lower one is number 11 there, which is being struck by lightning, which is about one in uh, 5 million. Um, and uh, the final uh, use of this particular slide, which is what uh, it's all about for open pit mining, is the acceptability of risk of slope failure for an open pit mine. And uh, right at the top there, you see mine slopes, and they have a very high probability of failure, one in 10, uh, one failure in 10 years. Uh, and that's not surprising because you are effectively destroying the slope uh, by blasting it to release the ore. However, the number of fatalities is extremely low. One in one hundredth of a fatality to one tenth of a fatality per annum. And uh, that is for a well-planned open pit mining project. You can clearly get into trouble uh, by um, cutting mining planning short, doing silly things, and that could move you way over to the right. But typical open pit mine slopes today are in that region uh, of a very high probability of failure, but a very low risk of fatality. One of the issues that uh, has an impact on this is blasting. And uh, I'd like to uh, point out here <clears throat> the difference between a, a rather heavy blast that you see on the top slide there, where the slopes are looking pretty rugged, and where access to each of the benches might not be possible because of small rock falls. And uh, the lower photograph shows a well-planned and carefully executed blast design 
uh, where you can get access to almost all of the face of the of the mine. So blasting uh, is one of the factors that we can control uh, by very careful blasting. Here's an example of uh, blasting in uh, Chukikamata. And what you see there in the foreground uh, is little heaps of, of soil above each blast hole. Blast holes are perhaps nine inches in diameter and might be 50 feet deep. And these are filled with explosives and are detonated electrically in a sequence that's calculated uh, to create the best type of blast. And what that involves is detonating holes along the crest first, so that you're breaking the rock outwards at the, at the freest end. And then each subsequent line of holes parallel to the crest is detonated sequentially with uh, a few hundredths of a second uh, between them. So that the uh, blast is not just one big bang, it's a, a peeling off of the rock as it's damaged and loosened and uh, pushed outwards by the blast. A large blast of this kind could involve about one million tons of rock. And uh, the design is extremely important in terms of overall bench and overall slope stability. Uh, he has a, a case where you see a, a bench being taken down to deepen the base of the, of the pit uh, and uh, the uh, large plumes of smoke in the front of the bench show that that was the first to go off and then the failure, uh, the blasting progressed back towards the back of the slope uh, with time. And uh, the, the bottom slide there simply shows a heap of broken rock ready to be loaded up and taken away. Blasting is an enormously important component of good open pit mining uh, and has a huge impact on the way in which the, the pit behaves. Here's a, an, an overall view of the Chukikamata mine in 2013. Uh, and you'll see that there are very steep slopes on the east wall, which is on the right of the photograph, uh, right at the bottom of the, of the uh, pit. Uh, the slopes are 53 degrees to the horizontal, which is an extraordinarily steep slope in, uh, in open pit mines. And uh, these are achieved by very careful design and, and good blasting. And, and knowledge of the, of the uh, rock properties as the mine is taken down. Uh, on the left hand side, the white line defines the main fault running right through the the uh, mine, which is the host of, of much of the ore. And below it is, is good rock, similar to that on the right. And above it is a much poorer quality rock. Uh, so the float slopes have to be flatter. And uh, there is significant instability in some of those slopes that has to be dealt with on, a, on an almost daily basis. I'd like to step back now to 1957. Uh, when I moved uh, from my university years at the University of Cape Town to uh, uh, the central part of South Africa, uh, where I was, I joined the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And I worked there for nine years on rock bursts in deep level gold mines. The mines at that time in South Africa were uh, approaching uh, three kilometers of depth and uh, where uh, you had extremely violent failures, many of which resulted in, in significant fatalities. And I spent nine years as a mechanical engineer, that's how I had graduated, treating rock as an engineering material. And uh, at the end of that time, I moved to London, where I was appointed uh, a research a reader and then a professor in the Royal School of Mines. And I uh, realized very quickly that there was no market for deep level gold mining in, in uh, Europe. And that what I'd done in South Africa at uh, 3,000 3, uh, meters below surface wasn't really relevant to uh, what was of interest to miners in, in London. Many large mines around the world had head offices in London, and many of those mines were moving towards large open pits. And so I decided very quickly 
that uh, rock slope stability uh, was an appropriate field in which to work. And the first result of that was the publication of this book called Rock Slope Engineering, which was published in 1971. Moving on 40 years, and here are three books published in 2009, 2013, and 2018 uh, by the equivalent body uh, in Australia called the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And uh, uh, Dr. John Reed, uh, an engineering geologist who'd worked in open pit mines, was the principal uh, leader of the project that resulted in the publication of three, these three books. And if you're at all interested in slope stability in open pit mines, these books belong on your bookshelf. Now, what do we actually do when we look at the stability of the slopes? First of all, uh, we look at some very simple cases here, uh, a plain failure where you just have a a slab of rock sliding on an, an existing discontinuity, which may be a fault or a shear zone or a joint, which is inclined in an inappropriate direction, and the block of rock simply slides off it. That's the upper left. Sometimes uh, you have two of those discontinuities intersecting to give you a wedge, as you see on the upper right. And uh, on the lower right, you see a different type of failure, which is toppling failure where the discontinuities are near vertical and uh, the slabs of rock uh, topple into the, into the pit. And when the rock is heavily broken up and begins to behave more like a soil than, than individual blocks of large, large blocks of rock, uh, you tend to get circular failure, which is similar to that which you would get in soil slopes. Now, in order to do the analysis of uh, uh, these slopes, you need a lot of information. And uh, I mentioned that I was appointed a geotechnical consultant to Kodelka uh, on Chukikamata in 1992. And uh, uh, with John Reed from Australia, who joined me as a, as a consultant, uh, we set out a list of what they needed to do to get sufficient information to design the mine properly. And that, uh, the table you see there is a pretty formidable one. And uh, the results that you see were acquired over about five, maybe 10 years. And there were listed there many, many laboratory tests, 122 miles of bench mapping and 115 miles of diamond core drilling in and around the open pit mine. So that's a huge amount of information which is collected. And you might say, isn't that overkill? The answer is no, not if you're designing a mine of this size. You really need to know what it is that you're, you're doing. Here's a, a different presentation of that information. This is looking down, if you like, from a satellite and you see the distribution of different types of rock on the left and the structural features uh, as they intersect the, the open pit benches on the right. So this is the kind of information that you need to have available when you start uh, into the design of the mine. I'm going to discuss one particular example which incorporates many of the, of the uh, issues that we've talked about and uh, that uh, uh, why you need so much information in order to, to uh, deal with these problems. And uh, at the time that I visited there last in 2018, the mine was mining at the rate of 500,000 tons of rock per day. 130,000 tons of that were copper and molybdenum ore. And that ore was transported to the surface crushers, the, you see there on the right, the E4 crusher, and the uh, ore was transported on uh, conveyor belts, which went up the M1 tunnel, which is the tunnel on the left there, and uh, uh, then was transferred in a transfer station to the K1 tunnel, which ran uh, from there to the crusher. Uh, obviously, there's a limited length over which you can run uh, a six foot wide 
conveyor belt and, and uh, those conveyors are, are uh, uh, perhaps uh, almost a mile long. And that's about the limit that, that it's practical to run a conveyor system. And uh, what uh, I want to talk about in particular is the design of the, of the transfer station, uh, which was a cavern about 100 meters behind the active slope uh, in the, uh, as you so see there, with a green blob uh, identifying its location. When the ore arrives at the transfer station on the, one of the two belts in the N1 tunnel, uh, it is brought up to a tipping point and it dumps the ore into a, basically a funnel, uh, which then deposits it onto uh, conveyor belts in the, in the K1 tunnel, which is at right angles to the M1 tunnel. And you'll see the dashed line in the lower right hand side there, defining the profile of the, of the tunnel and the two conveyor systems, which take the ore up, uphill then to the uh, surface crusher. And uh, uh, so what we are concerned about in this is the stability of that particular cavern. Uh, you have to realize that the cavern is actually in an active slope. In other words, you'll see the location of the cavern there marked with a big red arrow. And uh, it's about halfway up, or almost halfway up, the overall slope of the east wall. And mining is still going on at the base of that slope. So there is ongoing movement of the rock mass in which the uh, conveyor cavern has been excavated. And so it's, it's essential that no instability should occur because you don't want rock dumped onto the conveyors and, and uh, causing disruption in that flow of material uh, up to the, to the crusher and the processing plant. It was decided that uh, an analysis of this particular chamber would be carried out using the Atasca Model 3 deck. Uh, this is a very sophisticated and complex three-dimensional uh, numerical model where individual blocks of rock can be in incorporated together with major structural features there. And you see on the left hand side, uh, small blocks representing the, the discrete elements of the composite mass. These, these might be two, three or four meter sized blocks, but on the scale of a 3000 feet high slope, uh, it, it looks awfully like a soil when you look at it from far enough away. And uh, Superimposed on that are major features like the faults and the shear zones uh, that are the result of, of movement of the rock mass during its formation period. And uh, the purpose of this particular uh, numerical model was to analyze the de deformations of the rock mass, particularly those around the crusher chamber, uh, with ongoing mining. Um, at that point, the decision had been made, as I'll describe it in a moment, to uh, change to an underground mining method, but there were still several years of mining ahead that had to be accommodated uh, and that the stability of the uh, transfer chamber was critical for. Here's a, a picture of a section through the transfer chamber in the three deck model on the left, and you see the K1 tunnel coming up uh, from the left hand side, the incline tunnel, and the tunnel at right angles to it, the uh, sorry, the M1 tunnel and the K1 tunnel going off uh, into the rock behind the, the chamber. And the purpose of this particular uh, illustration is to set the groundwork for the design of uh, stabilizing uh, cables. On the right hand side, there you see uh, long uh, steel cables which are stressed in order to maintain the stability of the walls and the end walls and the, and the, and the roof of this transfer station. And uh, the colors there represent the stresses in each of those cables required to maintain the stability of this cavern throughout the, the remaining life of the open pit mine uh, where it still had to carry the uh, ore up to the crusher. One of the, the key issues here is, is uh, monitoring 
the behavior of the overall rock mass to ensure that you're not uh, just doing dreamland calculations. The, the uh, uh, open pit at Ch Chukikamata uh, had at that time, uh, and still has, about a thousand prisms, as you see on the left there. Uh, the, the arrow points to the actual glass uh, cube, cube prism, uh, which reflects the light back to a, a monitoring station. And that's at the top of a steel pipe. And that pipe is buried a further six feet or so into the ground uh, and concreted in place. So it's very uh, firmly anchored and it reflects movements in the rock mass. And on the lower right there, you see the automatically controlled theodolites. Uh, there are seven stations in the pit uh, equipped with these, and they monitor about every 20 minutes. They scan the pit and uh, transmit the, the information back to a central processing station, uh, which then calculates the behavior of the rock mass throughout the open pit mine. And uh, this is very sensitive and uh, uh, it's possible to pick up any anomalies, any developing failures uh, very quickly in this type of analysis, in, in, in this type of monitoring system and the analysis associated with it. In addition to the fixed prisms, uh, the use of radar is also very important because a, a prism might might not be in a very convenient place if you're standing at the crest of the pit and you see a slope that you think is moving and there isn't a prison within within uh, 100 meters or so of it. You really need another measuring system and radar is the tool that's used there. These devices can measure up to two miles with a, a resolution accuracy of a few millimeters. So it's a very precise tool that you can focus on a piece of rock that you suspect is unstable and that there are several of these that have been uh, stationed around the tricky Kamata mine. Here's a comparison between the computed displacements on the upper left uh, calculated by the three deck analysis I've described and the measured displacements of the same area uh, on the lower right <clears throat> and the red arrows there indicate a, a very good uh, coincidence in calculated displacements in these two pictures. The shape of the of the red zone is a little bit different, but obviously it would be uh, unrealistic to expect perfect agreement between these uh, for such a huge slope with such unknown properties that you're dealing with. Turning now to the uh, to the uh, decision to change from open pit to, to underground mining. Here is a photograph of a fleet of 400 ton trucks hauling waste rock up to, up to the surface. You remember I said that the, the mining rate was about 500,000 tons per day, of which 130,000 tons were ore. The rest of it is waste rock and that has to be transported out of the mine uh, to the surface. And these trucks uh, are 400 tons capacity each and they bring the rock up a distance of a, almost seven miles from the bottom of the Chukikamata open pit. That's about a two hour drive and so in order to accommodate enough capacity they have 200 or so of these trucks operating full time during a, a working day. And uh, that as you can imagine is not a cheap operation. They're huge they, are, they consume a huge amount of gasoline or diesel and uh, they are not cheap to either purchase or to maintain. And there comes a point where many um, mining engineers estimate that on this scale, about 50% of the operating cost of the open pit mine is actually associated with transporting rock to surface. So there clearly is a, an economic limit below which it it's, doesn't make a lot of sense to mine, even if it's physically possible to do so. But, uh, and it certainly Chukit Kamada could have been made much deeper from a technical point of view, but economically it doesn't make too much sense. And so in uh, 2019, the uh, operation of the open pit changed to an underground rock caving operation 
that I'll describe in a moment, and the open pit mining was gradually phased out. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, if it's uh, completed yet, but, uh, it, and of course the pit doesn't go away, it's still there, uh, but the, these, this fleet of 400-ton uh, trucks is no, no longer required. I don't have information on the block caving operation at Chukikamata. Uh, it's, a, it's a young operation and, and there isn't a lot of information currently available, uh, but I have taken the liberty of uh, getting the permission from uh, Professor Sainsbury in Australia to uh, show you these slides from the Palabora open pit mine in South Africa, uh, which went this route many years before Chukikamata. And you'll see on the left hand side there, the open pit at the top and an underground mining operation uh, where the, the, uh, an array of uh, tunnels and uh, draw points are created and where the uh, upward drilling of uh, blast holes is used to break the ore and collapse it into the draw points and move it out as, as ore. Obviously this can be very uh, closely targeted and so you're not faced with a huge quantity of waste rock that you are in open pit mining, but uh, uh, you see there that the, as you move from left to right, the size of the underground block uh, cave slowly in, uh, increases and in the final slide there it's interacting with the open pit and uh, if you look at the air photo of the uh, open pit you'll see a, a very large slide has been induced there by the block caving in a mine that was otherwise as stable as Chukikamata. There were no slope failures in the mine itself except for this one which was induced by the change to uh, underground block caving. Uh, so this is a story of, of uh, the sort of change that you would go through from open pit to, to underground block cave mining for the reasons of uh, uh, overall economics. Uh, this gives you a higher concentration of, uh, of uh, valuable ore and uh, a cheaper uh, waste disposal process. And finally, uh, this is really just for, for interest, this is an analysis of a block cave uh, using the Itasca program 3-deck and I'll let it run for a couple of times so that you can see the development of the uh, block cave there and uh, the interaction with the surface mine above. Um, and uh, these are enormously powerful programs which have been developed over the last 20 odd years or more and uh, which uh, are a glimpse of the future for what's available for, for mine planning. And I thank Itasca for permission to publish that particular diagram. And that brings me to the end of this presentation, uh, which I hope you would have found interesting. And uh, that if you have questions, I believe that there will be facilities for these to be dealt with online as we move forward. Thank you. I might just ask um, uh, a question I've heard you answer uh, before, but I think it's worth um, repeating. And that is um, your advice to young professionals who are just starting out in their careers on, uh, in, in, in rock engineering, whether it's open pit or, or underground. And what, what kind of advice would you give to them that would allow them to have the skills and the opportunities to participate in world-class projects like Chuki Kamada? Uh, basically, uh, what I recommend is equivalent to the process of uh, uh, being an, a, a, a junior engineer or, or geologist uh, in any mining operation and uh, effectively going through an apprenticeship to lead you to a better understanding of how the whole process works. What you will have learned at university is, is great, but uh, it's not hands-on enough uh, to enable you to answer the kind of questions that arise on a daily basis 
in a large mine, be it open put or underground. So uh, uh, there's nothing like hands-on experience to, to enable you to consolidate your overall knowledge in the field and to be able to deal with practical problems. That's a very simple question to a very complex uh, question, but I hope it's something uh, that you can go with. Thank you. Uh, we have one first question. Hello, Dr. Hook. This is Aman from Freeport. First of all, big fan. Uh, secondly, uh, I have a generalized question for you as well. What is your thought process about implementing some of the experimental and novel approaches for slope stability as compared to some of the uh, procedures that you have implemented in large caverns over the past years? Thank you. Uh, my understanding of what you asked is the difference between implementing knowledge in slopes versus underground uh, caverns. Uh, is, is that, am I correct in that? Uh, Yes, some of the experimental and novel approaches in slope stability um, in open pit compared to underground caverns. Yeah, they're they're, they're basically parallel processes. There are many uh, pieces of information that you need in underground engineering. For example, the, the overall stress state in the rock surrounding the excavation, and the way in which the uh, uh, surrounding rock. Uh, interacts with the breaking rock around the immediate excavation boundaries in order to create a, a stable but broken uh, rock mass. And uh, so the, the process is, is very much confined by the nature of what you're doing, in other words, mining in a highly stressed environment. The situation in, in uh, open pit mines is quite different in that you're looking at gravity loading of whatever rock happens to be loose and how, how deep that looseness goes back into the slope. So uh, there you're dealing with, with gravitational loading and the failure processes uh, are uh, predominantly sliding on discontinuities with, in general, relatively little failure of the intact rock pieces. Quite different from underground where you might have uh, at the extreme massive failure uh, in other words, rock bursts in the solid rock mass itself. So uh, the the process in, in slopes is rather more gentle, but controlled by structural discontinuities. In other words, in other ways, they are very, very similar. You use the same sort of technology, the same programs to do the calculations, uh, but it, the emphasis is a little bit different from one to the other. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Hook? We're quite a shy group here. Um, <laughs> engine engineers are, are shy by nature. They're mostly Norwegians and Swedes. You don't have to be shy. <laughs> yes. Next question. Hi, my name is Justine Ely. I am from the Robinson Mine in Nevada. And I have kind of a general, but not general question to ask. Uh, what are your thoughts or experiences keeping active haulage routes open over slow moving, but constant moving slopes? Um, my understanding is the question was, what is the difference between uh, failing slopes, rapidly moving in other words, and creeping slopes where the movements are slow but, but uh, still important. Is, is that a reasonable summary? Uh, correct, and, uh, but still keeping active haulage over a slow creeping slope. Sorry, I didn't hear that very well, just repeat it. Um, just w was wondering your thoughts on keeping an active haul road open over a slow creeping slope? Uh, if we're talking about active haul roads, the, the thing that you have to uh, avoid is rock falls um, because they can be 
extremely dangerous if if they occur <clears throat> with uh, movements on the on the on the highway on the road, and uh, which means that that you have to pay a lot of attention to the bench designs adjacent to Hall roads, uh, much more so than you do for the general uh, mining slopes, which are removed from the, from the roads. Uh, so uh, you, in, in planning the activities of the geotechnical team on a mine, there has to be an emphasis on those facilities that are critical to sudden failure, such as the slopes uh, adjacent to a whole road or adjacent to a crusher station or uh, forming a critical uh, part of the boundary uh, of the slope. Uh, each one has to be assessed uh, for its, its contribution to the dangerous operation uh, if uh, there is failure occurring on that uh, slope. So uh, the, the difference in analysis is one of of how much effort you have to put into it, uh, depending on the nature of the uh, damage that could be caused if it failed. And obviously there's a great deal of difference between a, a, a failure on a whole road, which might be quite small, but if it uh, knocks a truck off the, off the bench or uh, creates a holdup to the transportation system is much more serious than the same failure in a remote slope in the pit. Thank you. Next question. Dr. Hook, Brad, Brad Ross from the Geotechnical Center of Excellence. I really appreciate you talking to us tonight. You, you've seen a lot of changes in our, in our industry and, and have been a part of a lot of major accomplishments. What do you think we should be working on going forward if we're going to continue to improve like the improvements that you've made for us? Um, uh, everything. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, there, there are, there's a good foundation of knowledge today from work that's been done over the last 50 odd years uh, since rock mechanics became a discipline in its own right. And uh, uh, there have been many good advances throughout throughout the world in terms of the amount of knowledge. The, the issue is application of that knowledge. Uh, and that means that uh, there has to be attention paid to uh, young people coming on site as, as mining engineers or, or engineering geologists. Uh, the management has to give them the opportunity of really working with the practical miners and uh, applying their knowledge. So there's nothing magic about it. It's like any other uh, industry um, that you have to allow the apprentices to actually get their hands dirty, do the work, uh, be associated with people who've been there a long time and, and who know what goes on. Um, and sometimes it pays for those individuals perhaps to take a bit of time off and do part or maybe the whole of another degree, a master's degree, for example, and then come back. It's, it's quite, I've seen quite commonly that being done on big operations in mines where uh, a, a member of staff will disappear for a couple of years and then return uh, with in my view, the best type of knowledge because they come from a practical situation and they go to the university looking for solutions to those problems and coming back and being able to apply it. That's about as ideal as you can get. Uh, so uh, if you're in a mine at the moment, you're working on a, on a, uh, at a relatively junior level, consider taking time off it doesn't have to be continuous, but you could go a few months at a time or sign up for, for correspondence and uh, take some courses while you're there. Uh, it's, it's amazing how effective that can be if it's done. Thanks, next question. Yeah, hi, Dr. Hook, uh, Jordan Severin, PITO Associates. Uh, just a lighthearted question. Uh, if you go back and change something in your career, 
you know, looking back, what would you change in it? Sorry, can you just repeat that? Sure. If you, if you go back and change something in your career, what would you change? What would you change? My career or yours? <laughs> there's, a, there's a hell of a lot we change in mine. You can answer both those questions. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I started life as a mechanical engineer, and most of my career is, is just a, a series of accidents that uh, I happened to be available when there was a particular post going, and so I moved many times uh, from uh, where I was born in, in Zimbabwe to Cape to Cape Town, and then to Pretoria in South Africa, then to London, uh, then to Vancouver, back to Toronto, and uh, back to Vancouver again. So I've moved all over the place in different positions, and I think. Uh, perhaps a little bit too extreme, but you should look at the opportunity for uh, for change, for finding different experience somewhere else. If you're looking to to advance your career, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're unhappy where you are, but you have to look at your own career and say, where am I going with this? And what information do I need to improve my understanding and my ability? Uh, so, work at that and, and uh, ask for opinions, ask, ask, you know, write to people like me or Lauren or whoever, ask for, for opinions on what you, what they think you should be adding to your own career. Uh, I can't say much more than that because that's the way it works. Next question. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Hook. It's uh, Cameron Clayton from Tetra Tech. Um, just uh, so today I heard a lot about uh, reliability based approaches to design acceptance criteria and so on, um, slope stability analysis. What are your opinions on that as the way moving forward uh, what's the work that we do? Um, that's a good question. In fact, I was thinking about it today uh, when I was uh, putting together some uh, material on this course on this uh, uh, lecture and uh, <clears throat> it is necessary to consider risk at whatever level you do it. It could be very simple uh, uh, saying clearly I can't park my truck there because it could be moved, could be, uh, it could roll down the hill. That's the lowest level of risk. Uh, and, and obviously that's necessary. And, and many big mining companies have very strict rules on the, the uh, physical activities that go on, uh, how, where a vehicle should be parked, how close people should be working. I, I remember one, uh, in Chukikamata at one stage, a miner was killed, uh, by, uh, he was, he was, uh, using a, a backhoe and, uh, cutting the face of, off a slope and he, he went a bit too far and the slope fell onto him. And that kind of thing, uh, is, is, uh, something that can only be controlled by the knowledge of the operator, but also by the warnings that are put in place by the mine staff. So there are necessarily rules about how the equipment should be operated, how wide the road should be, how stable the slopes uh, on the whole road should be. Uh, and uh, effectively, uh, the, the whole mining operation has to recognize that working with, with rock, which is a largely unknown material to us as, as uh, uh, engineers, and working with, with very steep slopes in many cases, where you're very close to the limit, is, is a dangerous operation. And having, as Chuki Kamata did, a very extensive monitoring system uh, is very hope, very useful, but not too many mines uh, have that level of, of uh, instrumentation. So you have to uh, work with the staff to try and ensure that the, the level of understanding of cooperation and of information it's no good knowing something if you don't talk to people about it and inform them that such and such a slope 
needs attention and needs perhaps some some redesign. Um, there are no simple answers. Uh, it's it's it has to become part of your culture uh, in working uh, as a geotechnical engineer or as a mining engineer or as an engineering geologist on a mine. Uh, it, you, you just have to become part of the culture. But the management has to be has to recognise that it's necessary to provide the time and the provision for people to take that kind of uh, extra extra time, and uh, not to be working ten hours a day on just producing ore. Thank. You. Just one one more question. I think we have time for. Sorry, just just as a follow up to that. So, but from a, a more holistic or general perspective, um, you know, we I, I heard today a lot of, about a lot of complex algorithms to be used to calculate design acceptance criteria based on reliability-based approaches and so on. Um, you know, when, when Chuki Kamata was designed, you didn't have those sorts of approaches, right? You didn't have the probability of failures. You didn't, you didn't incorporate all of that holistically into the design approach. Um, and it seems that there's uh, more of a movement towards that now. And is it just not overcomplicating thing? You, 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 you gave the example of the equipment operator. Um, you know, having a reliability-based approach to design acceptance criteria isn't going to help that that equipment operator make his decision in the field. So, is it, is it not just overcomplicating the whole process of, of slope design and, and risk? I, I don't think so, and I, and I don't agree that this is a new process. I've been uh, consulting for 25 years now. And before that, uh, as working as an academic, and so this information has been available for a long time, and has been increasingly uh, adopted by mining companies. Chucky Kamata is an outstanding example of that. Uh, they've been very active right from the beginning, and I worked for them for 25 years uh, in being acceptant, uh, uh, being accepting to. Uh, the the availability of knowledge that doesn't mean that everybody on site has to become a, a, an expert in rock mechanics not at all uh, it's but it's necessary for the information generated by the geotechnical group to be transmitted uh, in a user-friendly way to the operating staff uh, and um, that can only be done if if those uh, people are active on site, uh, are prepared to get into the pit. You can't sit in an office on a mine and and design the mine. You've got to be out there in the field uh, with, a, with a hammer uh, or sitting in a, in a truck with an operator and watching what he does. Um, and I believe that that's feasible. Uh, it's difficult if the mine staff is too small. Uh, you simply don't have enough capacity to to cover it, and so uh, that's why I gave that example of the uh, level of information required at Chuki Kamata, and obviously the huge cost associated with that. Now, if you're producing the amount of ore that Chuki Kamata does, you can afford it. If you're a smaller mine, uh, it's difficult to justify those costs, but you've got to at least be uh, in recognition of the fact that the engineers need the opportunity, the engineers and geologists, of getting out there, working with the, with the mine staff, uh, participating in meetings, of planning meetings, so that the maximum amount of information that's possible is transmitted throughout the organization and not simply uh, confined to the, to the four walls of an office in the, in the building. That gets you nowhere at all. Uh, it has to be an active participation of everybody. Uh, in trying to to utilize the information uh, that is currently available and it's increasing all the time it's not uh, it's not as complicated as as the, as the last questioner made it sound uh, and I think if you think back to what I've said today uh, it's all pretty simple stuff there are no uh, differential equations or anything like that those are necessary for the for the science guys to work with, but in engineering, it's it's pretty simple, basic stuff, and it's available. 
Okay, thanks so much for your, your openness in answering those um, questions and for your um, lecture, and I believe it will be online for people to look at again and, and uh, learn, uh, learn even more the second time. Um, Brad has a, a toast, I believe. Good evening, everyone. And, and Dr. Hook, thank you so much. We, we really appreciate uh, your, your sharing your knowledge and information with us. As always, we, we, uh, we learn a lot from you. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to actually propose a toast. And, and I think all of you have had uh, perhaps a glass of champagne or, or a sparkling uh, cider put in front of you. Uh, to propose a toast to somebody that is a teacher Somebody that basically every one of us that is in the field has learned from in one form and, or, or another. To an innovator, somebody that has built tools and policies and procedures that have fundamentally changed the way that we do our work. Somebody that's a leader, somebody that's actually we follow to to do the things that he's done and, and, and accomplish the things that he's accomplished. So we as an we as industry, we as a profession, owe Everett Hook a debt of gratitude. And so I propose a toast to Everett. We appreciate everything you've done, you've done for us. We thank you. Salute. Thank you. Salute.